Hello and welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today is Blaine Harden, whose new book, Murder at the Mission, is about the murder of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman and what followed. Blaine, thank you so much for um, agreeing to be interviewed today. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you. I was so interested in reading your book about the Whitmans because when I was a little girl, there was a series of what we used to call orange biographies. Um, they were the Childhood of Famous American series at my library, my public library in Detroit, and I read the book about Narcissa Whitman. And I was fascinated by it. I was so fascinated that when I went to Walla Walla, Washington, to do a program, they took me to the cabin where you can still see the wagon wheel ruts in, in, in the ground. Um, and then, so my view of Narcissa Whitman and her husband Marcus was totally shaped by that biography that I read when I was eight years old. And I really, I would love to find a copy and read it now because I have no memory of whether they talked about, whether the author talked about their deaths. And they certainly didn't talk about anything that you discuss in Murder at the Mission. So what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, my experience was sort of similar to yours. I grew up in Moses Lake, small town in eastern Washington. Um, and when I was in fifth grade, uh, there was a state approved play about the Whitmans that was performed by our class. And the, the simple message that I remember from that play, which I finally got the, 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 the transcript of it after looking, it took me a while to find it, but the simple message that I remembered as, as a little boy was missionaries were good, Indians were bad, and thank God for missionaries, um, and thank God for white people. Uh, and that was, that was the message that I heard, and it, 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 uh, un about three or four years ago, after I'd finished uh, a, a book about North Korea, I was looking to write more about the Pacific Northwest. I'd written a book about the Columbia River. And so I went back to the Whitman story. Um, something about it just seemed interesting. And at the University of Wa Washington Library, I found, you know, there are five or 600 books about the Whitmans. <laughs> they were very, very famous for a time in America. And I, I found out that what I had learned was really a pack of lies. Uh, and it wasn't just a, 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 uh, an exaggeration. It was an elaborate uh, conspiracy of fraud perpetuated, created and perpetuated by Protestant clerics in the state of Oregon. Uh, and what's also interesting about it is that it was um, perpetuated brilliantly and in a, in a way that was a propaganda coup uh, for the Reverend Henry Spaulding, who was a colleague of the Whitmans. In fact, he was almost murdered by the Cayuse along with the Whitmans in 1847. About 20 years after the murder, he made up a story that Whitman, before he was killed, had traveled to Washington and somehow persuaded the president at the time, John Tyler, to save the Pacific Northwest from a British Catholic Indian plot to steal it away for Canada and for the crown. It's all nonsense. But Spalding took his story uh, back to Washington, DC in 1871 and managed to market it, to sell it to the US Senate and the House of Representatives, which reprinted it in full. And as a uh, US government document, it became a primary source for historians. And within three or four years, history books, encyclopedias, the major newspapers of America had swallowed the thing hook, bait, and sinker. And Spalding's lie about the Whitmans became the official history of the Pacific Northwest for about 40 years. 
Spalding is a very interesting character, isn't he? He's someone who, um, who certainly, who is certainly more, more interested, or in a funny way, in a strange way, I think he, he and his wife were closer to the um, the Indians, the Native Americans that they were trying to proselytize than, than the Whitmans were. I mean, they learned the language. His wife was evidently a really good linguist. There's a lot of paradox around the yes. Spaldings. Um, uh, I, I think that Spaulding's strangeness, it, it came from, from his background. He, he grew up as, a, as a, an orphan. Uh, his mother uh, was not married. He was sort of farmed out to people who rejected him. Uh, he managed to join a church in a small town in upstate New York, which was where Mark Narcissa Whitman was, was also a member of the church. And then he went to uh, the equivalent of junior high or junior, uh, junior college there with Narcissa, and he fell in love with her. And he was the boy from the, the wrong side of the tracks. He had very little money, probably dressed terribly. He, he had no confidence. He could barely read. Uh, Narcissa was the belle of the ball in, in, in that small town. She was attractive. She had a beautiful singing voice. She was smart and she had a rich daddy. So uh, Spalding proposed to her when he was in his early 20s and she said, no way, Jack, I'm not marrying you. <laughs> and Spalding never forgave it. Spalding went on to become a, uh, uh, he went to uh, a theology school in, in Cleveland and he became a, a quite well-educated uh, Presbyterian minister uh, and, and married. Um, but he never forgot Narcissa, and he never forgave her. And one of the great ironies of the American West is that they came to the West together, and they yes. shared a tent. Um, Narcissa, by that time, had married Marcus Whitman. Uh, uh, Spalding was married to Eliza. Uh, and but they shared a tent, and this was a honeymoon trip for Narcissa and Marcus. Uh, and Spalding, by most accounts, was probably in the tent uh, on the nights that they were celebrating their honeymoon, and maybe perhaps on the night where she conceived her one and only child. Yeah. Uh, and Spalding's mental health was never very stable. He was also a, always an irritating, uh, angry man. And this, this clearly did not help. Uh, right. Narcissa later wrote uh, in the years before she was, while she was in Oregon, but before she was killed, she wrote that they should never have come west with Spalding because he tormented them uh, constantly. So, and then the, the irony is that Spalding survived. He, did, he, was, he wasn't killed by the Cayuse. And this man who had tormented the Whitmans uh, while they were alive he decided after they were dead to turn them into legends, and he succeeded. Yeah, I, I, I wonder when you had this idea to explore the Whitmans, did you, did, at what point in writing the book, did you realize how much of the book was going to be post their deaths? Do you know what um, I mean? Because Very because, early on. Because yeah. It, it, it quickly became clear to me that Marcus Whitman was a man of his era. Uh, no, certainly no, he was not a great man. He was not a visionary. He was not a great humanist. He was a poor missionary. He lost interest in, in the Cayuse tribe um, and was much more interested in, in, in sort of becoming a land developer, uh, uh, welcoming white people to the Oregon country and and he he was quite good at that and uh, was much was highly respected by the the first settlers of Oregon so it, it it struck me that the story about his saving Oregon which was of course a pack of lies it's the lie and uh, how Americans swallow nonsense that makes them feel good uh that's and that's that that resonates today in our political moment. Uh, that's what appealed to me. So so in the book, the Whitmans are dead, uh, 
you know, in the first 80 pages or 90 pages of, of, a, of a 400 page book. And then the rest of it is the lie that Spalding created, how it spread across the country and why it was swallowed so eagerly by white Protestants in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And then how it was debunked, which I thought was incredibly interesting. And then the last part of the book, which which was something that I, I reported out. I'm a former newspaper reporter. And so I went out and I developed sources uh, amid, uh, among the, the Cayuse tribe who live on the Umatilla Reservation there in, in Northeastern Oregon. And I interviewed them and I got their story. And that th their story was one of 150 years of being the victim of this lie. So when they killed Marcus and Narcissa Whitman in 1847, they killed a failed missionary and a failed missionary doctor, Marcus Whitman was a medical doctor, who under their traditions deserved death because he had, he had not stopped a measles epidemic. Right. Um, and that was it. I mean, that's, that's who they killed. He, he, he was not uh, a famous American. Uh, but 20 years later, uh, strangely enough, Spalding and a few other uh, clerics in Oregon you know, they, they created this souffle of, of a lie about Whitman. And all of a sudden, the Cayuse were guilty of killing a great American hero. And then for a century, they lived with that and were tormented by it, impoverished, cheated out of land, pushed around, traumatized. Um, but there's a, there's a the, the story of their uh, of their life on the land at the reservation it has it has really i think a, a hopeful ending because they've done really well in the past 20 30 years and um they are finally moving beyond the consequences of that lie and one thing i wanted to say about the lie the reason that it it works so well and it this has echoes in our in our political life now is the lie about Spall, about whitman rushing to the white house and then saving oregon from foreigners plugs into many of the elements that make for a great demagogic lie in American culture. It was simple, it was hero driven, it was action packed, and it somehow seemed to be ordained by God. And this is the sort of story that people like, people will remember, and they're quite willing to ignore facts to cling to. Right. And, and I think that's what that, that's the reason I wrote this book, actually. That's the reason I managed to get it published. Was, yeah, yeah, the parallels are, are really interesting. And, and it, it just calls into question, for me, I, I just started thinking about other historical figures um, and wondering how much of what we know about them is really the way that they were. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But in in the case of this, the story about Whitman is is that it was a spectacularly um, spectacularly easy to prove lie, yeah. and the way it was debunked, which is really really fascinating, is that there was a a, a, a student at the University of Washington in the 1890s who was sort of sniffing around in the archives that he could find at the University of Washington. And he came to suspect that the story about Whitman, quote, saving Oregon from a British Catholic Indian plot was uh, a promotional scheme by Whitman College to raise money. So he was a smart guy and he went back to Yale uh, and started working in a graduate program in history. And he passed on his suspicions uh, and some of his notes and some of his documents to an eminent professor uh, there, uh, Professor Edward Gaylorn Bourne, who at that time was a, sort of a pioneer in the use of original sources. He was a, quote, scientific historian <laughs> who did not believe what grandpa said, but wanted to know what grandpa wrote when he actually saw something. So Bourne focused on the letters that the missionaries had written. And they were people of the book. They had gone to school. They were more educated than most people of their time. And they had written thousands of letters 
uh, more than a million words about this era of, of between 1836 and 1847 when the massacre occurred. And all those letters were stored in Boston at the a missionary outfit that had uh, sent them to the West to save the Indians, supposedly. Uh, so he went through the letters and it quickly became clear to him in less than, I think, a year of work that the whole story was bogus. And he, he ended up describing uh, uh, Spalding as one of the most indefatigable old frauds he'd ever come across in all of human history. Um, and he wrote this up for the American Historical uh, Association's annual convention, which was held in Michigan in, in 1900, December 1900. And it, it exploded the story. It, 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 it proved that it wasn't wrong. There was a headline in the... Um, in the Los Angeles Times, I think the next day, that said all the history books are going to have to be rewritten now because this was not true, and that is what happened over the next five years, in most of the United States. But very interestingly and important, it didn't happen in the Pacific Northwest. Um, right. Whitman College clung to this story, continued to raise money off of it, uh, although the money. Uh, revenues dissipated a lot after the, it was proved that the story was false. Uh, and the president of Whitman College, who, who actually made Whitman College into what it is now, which is an excellent, perhaps the may, probably the best liberal arts college in Washington state, and one of the best in the country. And it still is. And the school has acknowledged what happened there. But Penrose, who was the long serving president, he would not give up this story. He stuck with it and held these huge pageants celebrating how the West was won with Whitman as the great hero. And these were done in the 20s and 30s. And tens of thousands of people from Seattle and Portland and Spokane would come to hear this bogus story. And this is 20, 30, 40 years after it was proved false. But we wanted to believe it, so we did. So there was a statue of Whitman um, that was recently removed. Could you tell that? Could you tell us about that? What's interesting, this statue of Whitman, um, th there's a statue of Whitman that's, that's still, as, as of right now, as of our conversation, is in the Hall of Statuary in the U.S. Capitol. It's going to be removed in the coming months. But that statue wasn't put in place until 1953 which is 53 years after it was clearly demonstrated that Whitman was not a great man. He was not a great hero. He was a mediocre missionary. Uh, that, so uh, I think that point has not been well understood. Mm -hmm. But finally, the legislature in Washington state in its wisdom, wisdom this spring decided to pull Whitman out and replace him with Billy Franks Jr., who, uh, uh, a, uh, a tribal activist from Western Washington who was arrested more than 50 times. He was uh, a brave, nonviolent, um, irrepressible activist who forced the federal government in the state of Washington to give tribes their rights under the law. And for that, he, uh, he deserves to be in that position much more than Whitman. Right. So, Blaine, y y you know, you talked about one of your books, your earlier books was about the Columbia River, and y you've done um, a couple of books um, s about North Korea, and that you, you know, were a, 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 you worked for the Washington Post. And your first book, though, is ab about your time in, in Africa. And which I thought was really, really interesting because it gives a picture of what it was like now many years ago. Um, do you ever feel like for a, for another book, do you ever feel like going going back and and looking at at Africa based on, you know, not rewriting that earlier book, but being in conversation with the earlier book that you wrote. Yeah, it it would be it would be it would be um, a fascinating thing to do. It would be a hard thing to do and a really expensive thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I did it for the Washington Post in a time when the Washington Post was was 
was it's rich again now with Bezos, but it was it was quite rich when I was doing it uh, in the eight nineteen uh, eighties. Uh, it was you know ten years after Watergate, and the paper was flush with money, and so they gave me a very long leash to go out and and like I traveled for three weeks on the Congo River and wrote nothing except one or two story series for that, um, and um, so. Th- there are a couple things that have changed in Africa that I think are really worth monitoring. One is the coming of the Chinese, uh, funding um, infrastructure, uh, it's sort of really interwoven into the governing structure of of the country. Um, so that's that's really changed. And there's been some democratic flowering in 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 a smattering of of the countries in Africa. But a lot of the problems of of poor leadership, of artificial boundaries, of grinding poverty and population problems remain. Um, But one of the I I wanted to talk just a little bit because you asked me about the Africa book is that uh, I was a young it was my first foreign posting and I was in my 30s. You know, I had unlimited energy. I wasn't married. And all I did was travel and work and, and write. Um, and I was, it was such a happy time for me because the Africans um, were open. I mean, I would go into a place and people would tell me what's going on in their lives. The, the, the corrupt leaders of the countries and most of the leaders of the countries were corrupt. Um, they wouldn't talk to me, but they were, they were simply doing what they did, which is creaming off revenue for themselves. Um, but it was such an open, a, a completely wide open palette to paint on as, as, a, as a young reporter and wannabe book writer. Um, and I, it, as, a, as, a, as a journalist and as a writer and as an individual, I used to dream that I could fly in those years. I would sleep at night and I had this recurring dream that I could fly because there was so much to see and I was just enjoying it so much. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, I don't think I would have that dream again if I went back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul Theroux, who was um, was in the Peace Corps in in Africa, when his one of his more recent books is about his trip back to Africa, um, which I which I found very you know very interesting. Do you so what do you read when what 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 like what do you read? Well, I'm I read novels mostly. Um, uh, until recently, I read novels because they were such a uh, as a because I was a, I was a, a newspaper reporter and foreign correspondent for 32 years, most of my adult life. And um, that was a way to escape, you know, Philip Roth, Jonathan Franzen, uh, 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 the, the sort of the the the, the canon of. Uh, of uh, of popular literary writers, and, you, know, you know, I sort of kept up on that, um, and and now I read because I'm writing nonfiction. I I, I try to read, you know, masterpieces of, of nonfiction, um, and you know, I read so much for for like writing about um, Native Americans is for a non-Native American, and I'm obviously a non-Native American. Um, it's it's there's there's a lot of work you have to do and so you know i had to really read hundreds read parts of hundreds of books um just recently because of the uh, pbs um series on hemingway i had never read Hemingway. <laughs> i did maybe a short story or two in college and so i i, I just finished uh uh the, the sun also rises and farewell to arms and you know about two-thirds of those books were drek uh this this manly posing and ridiculous uh uh amounts of drinking and and uh, and strutting around but a a third of each one of those books had genius and action and you could see why hemingway was really something in the 20s and 30s you could see why he, people were so excited by him and so that, that i think that's what i've read most recently that that excited me well there's a really um, good novel by a writer named dan simmons in which hemingway is a character it's called the crook factory 
and um, it's, it's just, uh, just so much fun to read. So you might want to take a look at that. Yeah. yeah. His life was pure melodrama. Right. I mean, you couldn't make it up. It was so melodramatic. But he had such good lines in The Sun Also Rises. I remember Lady Brett Ashley saying, don't we pay for all the things we do, though? I yeah. thought that was such a She's fabulous. a great character. And I mean, in the PBS series, it points out that Hemingway was, you know, he was a uh, misogynist. Uh, abuser of women in many ways, but he was also a great enough artist that he could intuit the, you know, the, 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 the pain of women and get it on the page pretty well. Yeah. There's a really good mystery series set in North Korea. Um, have you read it by a former CIA yeah. intelligence? Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Murder at the Corio. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and Yes, and, and those are terrific because yeah. the author um, uh, is uh, who writes under a pseudonym. He really knows his subject as well as 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 anyone who does not live in North Korea. Right. And so they're, they're you know, and there's it's they're great drama, but they're also incredibly revelatory. Yes, I yeah, I, that's what I thought. I mean, one of the reasons I. One of the reasons I enjoy mysteries, or I most enjoy mysteries, where I learn something, and I really felt as though I understood North Korea um, a, a little bit better. That, that it opens it up, it opens up this closed society. I think those books. Same genre. I just read Red Sparrow, uh -huh. which is by a former CIA right. agent who just died last week, actually. Yeah. Um, right. And it is really good about uh, um, spycraft. Uh-huh. Um, let me just say one more book, and then I think our time is almost done. There's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful spy novel called A Shadow Intelligence, and it's by Oliver Harris, um, and it's MI. I, I like British intelligence stuff, too, but it's spycraft for the 21st century. It kind of updates. It's, it's, um, it's Le Carre-ish, but it's set in Kazakhstan, and it's really, it's really good. Oh my gosh, Blaine, you've got yeah, to be a great a follow for Red Sparrow. Yes, yeah, yep, a shadow intelligence. Yes. Okay. This has been an episode of Book Lust. My guest today was Blaine Harden, whose new book is Murder at the Mission, A Frontier Killing, Its Legacy of Lies, and the Taking of the American West. Blaine, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this book. I am so sad the Whitmans were not how they were presented to me when I was nine years old, um, but I felt as though I learned a lot, and I'm always grateful for a good book like this. Thank yeah. you. Oh, true history is more interesting than the phony history, I think. True. True. Thank you. Thank you.